Well, welcome to everyone here. It is so good not to be preaching to empty chairs, so I am so glad you guys are, are here. And um, just by way of introduction, a um, couple of quick announcements. Emails have gone out from the church regarding um, the, the services and the status and of all that. If you're not getting those emails, please go to the website and sign up. Also, um, there will be also on our front page, there will be updates as of the services and the upcoming weeks and so forth. So we want to encourage you to go and, and look at that. Um, on one side of this pandemic with a coronavirus, there is fear and frenzy. And I was talking to Rodney in North Africa this morning, and he said the, com- the whole country is on a complete shutdown. You can't get in, you can't get out. They can't replenish and restock the shelves. And uh, it, it's chaotic, and people are living in fear and, and, and again, this frenzy. And yet, on the other side, there is this, uh, find the right word, this, this dismissive uh, attitude, ah, you got nothing to worry about and, and all that. And I think as Christians, we need to love and we need to shepherd and come alongside those who maybe fear is legitimate and true and, and is available and to shepherd our family and friends and neighbors. And there's already a group in this body of believers here that said, that's telling us, hey, if you need any medicine, if you need any groceries, anything delivered, if in any way we can help, please, please contact the church. And this morning, I want to, this time is this, I want to look at the life of an encouraging man. So I want to, I want to start in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. If you would take your Bibles, please, and turn with me. I want to bounce off that. We, this would be a Bible study like, so we'll be bouncing around. Um, and what I want to do this morning, if you will, uh, while Ken is gone, is, is sort of to descend from the peaks and the mountains of the book of Romans and find our way through the valleys and the canyons of Acts, the book of Acts. And so with that, I want to start by looking at a biographical study of a man in the New Testament by the name of Joseph or perhaps nicknamed as Barnabas. And so this would be a biographical study on this man. This man has so uh, both encouraged and rebuked my heart. Uh, I've been under the scrutiny of scriptures in this man's life, and it's, so, it's been good. Hebrews 13, 7 says this, Remember your leaders, those who speak to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So there are three direct imperatives, commands in this passage. Remember, consider, and imitate. Remember, recall to mind what these men were like for you and how they lived their life. Consider the outcome of their life. The word consider is again and again, observe carefully their life, study them out. And how they, I love this one translation says, and how they closed a well-spent life. And then finally he says, and imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. By a way of application, what we'll do this morning is, we're going to ask the question at the end, what made these men or women? What made these men? What made them heroes of the faith? So with that, I'd like, I'd like us to turn back to the book of Acts chapter 4. Book of Acts, chapter 4, starting in verse 32. And as you're turning there, I want to pray for us this morning that the Spirit of God and 
by His power, by His mercy, would come and attend our heart and minister to us here and those who are watching and streaming online, that God would meet you right where you're at. Father God, we thank you. We love you, Lord. Father, this hour, this moment in America, in the world, is so different and is so difficult. So we ask, Lord, this morning that you would come and, Father, the, the, bring the freshness, the freshness of the Scriptures, the life and the breath of your Word into our lives, Lord, this morning. May your Spirit speak into the depth of our hearts this morning. Father, we thank you for all that you do in Christ's name. Amen and amen. The context in Acts 4, starting at verse 32, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to them was his own, meaning they became stewards of the goods and of the money that they've had. But, but all things were in common property to them, and a great power of the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and an abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as they needed. Luke then does something very unique for himself as he writes as the author of Acts. He, he singles out a man who seems to personify, if you will, he seems to personify the early church in her unity and in her generosity. Luke, who writes the book, is so fond of Barnabas. For the first time, he draws attention to a key figure in the book of Acts apart from the 12 apostles. And so he comes on the scene in half a dozen chapters, chapter 4, chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 13, and chapter 15. His legacy, his work, his faith left a profound impact on the early church. He invested his life his pers in personal lives, and he invested his life into the body of Christ wherever he went. So let's meet this man called Joseph. Verse 36, now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translates the son of encouragement. Being a Levite, a descendant from the tribe of Levite, a Jewish by birth, a Jewish by nationality, yet born on one of the biggest Mediterranean islands right off the coast of Lebanon and Syria, a 45-minute boat ride is the island of Cyprus. He would have been bilingual, speaking Hebrew and Greek, and at the time he was in Jerusalem. He would have still had relatives. As a matter of fact, his sister, Anna, in Acts 12.12, had a huge home, and much of the disciples and the apostles in those early days would come and worship and conduct services in her house. Her home was big enough to accommodate the church gathering. He's nicknamed by the apostles, not self-appointed, but nicknamed by the apostles as the son of encouragement. We could probably call him Bar Uncle Barney. A Semitic name, Barnebi, means the son of a prophet, a proclaimer. But in the Greek, he is the son of consolation or the son of encouragement. And again, he is nicknamed by the apostles that way. Let me lay some groundwork and definition. We're going to be talking about encouragement through this man's life. The Greek, the Greek word paraklin, para means alongside, to come alongside 
And kaleo is literally to call, to come alongside someone and to call them out, to encourage them, to comfort, to console, to help. Encouragers tend to be people who firm up others, are lifters. They're heavyweights. They're lifters. Encouragers are also supporters of people. Barclay says this, one who comes along and puts courage into the faint-hearted one, who nerves, who nerves the feeble arms for fight. Simply put, here's my definition. Loving the person you're with. Loving the person you're with. A little later, we'll see whether it's for five minutes, five hours, or five years. Loving the person you're with. It's the idea, as Nick mentioned, of close companion. Finding, finding the grace in others and encouraging them along the way. Discovering and developing the gifts in others. Encouraging and inspiring, sometimes seeing the unseen in people. So Barnabas comes on the scene. He's not an official apostle. He's one of the most generous, mature men. He was a man of grace and of courage. He was reliable. He was trustworthy. He was a lovable leader. He was full of life and joy. And the apostles rightly called him son of encouragement. Defining his work, defining his character, and defining his gifts. And speaking of gifts, Acts 4.37 says, number of, first thing we're going to look at is, encouragers are generous people. Encouragers are generous people. It says in verse 37, he who owned a track of land, sold it and brought it the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. We're not sure if Barnabas was rich, wealthy. We're not sure if this land was an inheritance. The uh, Levites were not supposed to inherit, uh, own land way back in the Old Testament, but now in, in Cyprus or Jerusalem, that those, bio, those laws were gone. And so we're not sure if he inherited this tract of land, this piece of property. We're not sure if he's a wealthy man. We're not sure if this is his 401k, if this was his investment. But what we gather from this passage is this. These early believers felt a sense of deep responsibility for one another, and they shared their very own goods with them. And this sharing went beyond, went beyond what they only made or what's available. It got to the point where they sold their private properties to meet the needs of others. What a beautiful thing. There is, there is a, just a modern day example. There's a family here years ago. They were getting ready to purchase cruise ship tickets came to one of their elders and said, we're about to go on a cruise, but before we make that purchase, is there anybody that is in need or hurting we can use that money for? It's putting others above your vacations and joys and all that. Not that all these things are wrong, but thinking about others before yourself, and that's exactly that's exactly what this first century church, this Barnabas, generous encouragers take a certain responsibility for others. They love the people they are with. Let me quote a passage you guys are familiar with. Therefore, Philippians 2, 1 through 5, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintain the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing, 
nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not only look out for your own personal interest, but also of the interest of others. Beautiful passage. And, and, and some of you know the name B.B. Warfield, one of my favorite writers. He, makes, he comments on this passage. Listen to what he says. He says, self-sacrifice brought Christ into the world. And self-sacrifice will lead us, his followers, not away from, but into the midst of men. How how applicable for us today. Whether, wherever men suffer, there will we be to comfort. Wherever men strive, there will we be to help. Wherever men fail, there will we be to uplift. Wherever men succeed, there will we be to rejoice. Self-sacrifice, Warfield says, means not indifferent to our times, and our fellows. It means absorption in them. He goes on, he says, it means not that we should live one life, your own life, not one life, but a thousand lives, binding ourselves to a thousand souls by the filaments of so loving a sympathy that their lives become our lives. We're absorbed in them and for them. Barnabas, we're not sure. We're not sure if he was a wealthy man. We're not sure if this was his private investment. We're not sure of anything. Here's a hint. In 1 Corinthians 9.6, Paul makes this sweeping, fast remark. He says, Or do only Barnabas and I not have the right to refrain from working? In other words, Barnabas went back in the ministry. He is in the ministry. He's on the mission field, and he is self-supportive. He goes back to work to support himself. So Luke does something so beautiful. He personifies the early church with this generous encouragers. As I said, encouragement is always about others. It's always about others. Second, or third, sorry. Acts 9, Acts 9. Encouragers advocate for the outcast. Encouragers advocate for the, for the outcast. Encouragers take risks, not for risk's own sake. It's not because they're gambling, risky type of people. They take risk for others. Acts 9.26. Turn with me there. And it says, After Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus, he began to preach Christ in Damascus, and a plot was discovered to, to do away with him. His disciples snuck, up on, snuck him out of Damascus, and he came to Jerusalem from the very base, obviously, where he left. He's a man like a fugitive on the run from his own countrymen. Verse 26 says, And he came to Jerusalem, and, and the verb is very, very tense, and, and, and it's very strong, and it says, He was trying He was trying over and over to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him because they did not believe that he was a disciple. And here is why. The ink is not yet dry earlier in chapter 9. Saul was, was ravaging the church, going after them, imprisoning them, killing them. And so the church was very, very suspicious of this man. Could this be a hoax? Is is Saul of Tarsus going to undermine the church? Is this this a hoax? They were critical, they were suspicious, and rightly so. Saul's old Jewish friends and colleagues would probably have nothing to do with him. He's a Christian. And now he's in Jerusalem, his beloved city, 
and he's all alone. The Jews would have nothing to do with him. The Christians would have nothing to him to do with him. And so he was an outsider on all sides. And so he needed a brother. He needed a friend. He needed an advocate in Jerusalem. He takes Barnabas, comes along and brings Saul of Tarsus into the very heart of the church, right to the disciples. He takes them right to the apostles. And look at, I love this, verse 27. It says, look with me, but Barnabas took hold of him. There is such a force in this verb. It's literally taking someone under your wings. It's grabbing someone by the arms. And he says, come with me. We're going to the apostles. And he brought him to the apostles. And and he described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. And he talked to him. And how at Damascus he spoke out boldly. He basically gave them Saul's old own testimony. Only someone like Barnabas, who has earned the trust and the faithfulness of the early church, can do this. I love this. Listen, the spirit of suspicion gives a way to peace and comfort in the body of Christ. What is the opposite of encouragement is having a critical spirit, always suspicious of people. They don't act right. They don't look right. They're not like us. To be a critical thinker is way different than being a critical person. There's a world of difference. To keep looking at the shortcomings and weaknesses of people. Verse 28, how beautiful and how Paul, how he, Paul, was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking the outsider became an insider. Verse 31, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace and being built up and on the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. You can say this, the ministry of Barnabas advocating for this rejected man on all sides became the ministry to the whole body of Jesus Christ. The son of encouragement to seem to have this spiritual sensitivity to people on the verge, on the outside, on the edge. Where did he get that from? Who had that eye? Who had that sensitivity to people who may not be accepted or rejected, or he might be the society's outcast. Who saw Matthew, the Levite, the tax collector, and brought him in? Who welcomed Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, and brought him in? Who spoke with the Samaritan woman of five husbands, who was the talk of the town? Who spoke to the woman and ministered to the woman who was caught in the very act of an adultery? Who was a friend of sinners? Who is a friend of rejects? That's where, that's Christ. That's where Barnabas gets this from, the master. I hope whatever the church did, I hope we would never be accused of this evangelical smugness where somehow some holy tribal, we're we're too pure, we're too clean for outsiders, for the rejects of society. May God have mercy on us. May we not become cliquish with the young and the beautiful and reject People on the outside. There's a beautiful picture in the Old Testament. We're not going to turn there, but First Chronicles 11:2 it says this. This is speaking of King David. He says, "Everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was in discontent, who was discontented, gathered to him to King David, 
and he became captain over them of 400. These were the rejects of society of his time. How would you like to have a congregation full of nothing but distressed, discontented, and people in debt to shepherd? David did that. He shepherded them. And yet, there was one man who advocated to King David, and that was Jonathan, that was in his life. Encouragers, encouragers are advocates. They're not about themselves. They're earthly reflection of the great advocate who could see beyond flesh and blood. Fourth, stick deeper. Turn with me to Acts eleven nineteen. Encouragers are about the spiritual good of others. Encouragers are about the spiritual good of others. Starting in Acts 11, Barnabas comes on the scene again. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, which would be modern day Lebanon, Cyprus and Antioch, which is northern Syria, southern Turkey area, right on the border, speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus, get this, men of Cyprus and Cyrene. Do you know where Cyrene is? It's modern day Libya from North Africa. These would have been the first Gentile missionaries. They leave Cyprus, they leave North Africa, and they get to Antioch, which is half a million people, third biggest city in the world at the time in the Roman Empire. And they get over there, who come to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching, preaching the Lord Jesus. And at the hand of the Lord was with them. There was a divine presence. And it says, quote, a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Verse 22. And the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas. They didn't send any of the apostles. They sent the committee of one, Barnabas. He earned the trustworthiness of the church in Jerusalem. And so they sent Barnabas to Antioch to assess the progress of the church. And he gets on the ground, verse 23, then it says this, And he arrived and witnessed the grace of God. He rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. He witnessed the grace of God. How do you, how do you witness the grace of God? It's there. The grace of God is there. He could clearly see that the grace of God is working. In all the immaturity of the church and the newness of the church, he could see the grace of God. True biblical definition of encouragement is looking for and finding and pointing out the grace of God in people, no matter where they're at, no matter where they're at. Not only did he witness the grace of God, verse 23, it says, he rejoiced with them. He rejoiced with them. He rejoiced for them. He could have been critical. He could have been one-dimensional personality, ministry type of style person. You guys are not doing it right. You're not like us in Jerusalem. You're missing this or you're missing that. You need to be cookie stamped and cookie cut by Jerusalem somehow. He rejoiced. Seeing the good work, he could have been jealous at heart. He could have been competitive. He could have been insecure. The Gentile church in Antioch are outdoing and outgrowing Jerusalem church. He loves it. He loves it. I love this quote. Listen to this. Derek Burnham says, It takes what I'm calling a big heartedness for a person to overcome jealousy, 
envy, division, and personality differences to reach out and become an encourager. Genuine godly love never ever looks on another believer's success as a threat. It looks on it as a blessing. It gets right in there, giving all the possible support it could possibly give immediately. Barclay called him the man with the biggest heart in the church. That's what encouragers do. And third, he began to apply his gifts. Look at verse 23. And he began to encourage them all with resolute hearts to remain true to the Lord. I love that King James Version says this, and and he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. This young, new, vibrant church needed to hear these words. He pleaded with the new converts for the secret of the perseverance of the saints is to cleave and to remain close and to abide unto the Lord with resolute hearts. To maintain the passion for Christ by staying true to Him is truly abiding in Him. That's what he was teaching. That's what the encourager is all about. The good, the spiritual good of every man, of every woman they come in contact with. And he does it over and over and over again. Acts 14, 21, returning from their first mission trip in Lestra and Iconium, he says, when they had preached the gospel to that city, they made many disciples and returned. And it says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying to them, through many tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. In chapter 13, verse 43, Pisidion, Antioch, another Antioch, they were encouraging them, continue in the grace of God. Seeing the spiritual good for everyone, his goal and his life, that saints would persevere in the grace of God. Let me make some application for us. What, what, what Nick read for us this morning says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort or, or encouragement, or pedi- the word pediclete, comfort. God the Father is the Father of all encouragement. It is in the very nature and it is in the very attribute of God to be an encouraging God. And as a matter of fact, one of the titles and the names of the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete, the guide, the comforter who comes along. Listen, I say this theologically, vertically saying is to say encouragement, true biblical encouragement is in our spiritual DNA. If the Spirit of God abides in us, we can't not be encouragers or something is wrong. Something is wrong. Here's what I'm asking us. Be an earthly reflection of the heavenly paraclete. Be an earthly reflection. Encouragement is not flattery. Flattery is not true encouragement. Flattery is defined as excessive and insincere praise. Much of what passes for encouragement in our churches these days is flattery in disguise. Encouragement is not telling someone only what they want to hear. Encouragement is not just spinning hard truth, difficult situations. Encouragement is not promising things God didn't promise them. Here is the most beautiful passage that that really balances this out. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. And later he says, Always, always seek to do good to those, to one another, 
and to everyone. Encouragement is a heart art. Encouragement is your heart pouring into someone else's heart. It is a heart art work. Hebrews 10.23, a lot of you know this passage. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us, here is the main verb in that text, let us consider, let us consider how to stir up and provoke one another. Provoke in a good way, okay? To love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some but encouraging, here's our word, encouraging one another all the more. When he says, consider how, he's saying this, think deeply and think purposely and think deliberately when you're together with one another, both in mind and heart. Everything about this passage is screaming to us, don't be fluffy, don't be frothy, be faithful, be faithful. Don't be shallow with one another, don't be shallow. And there seems this escalation as the day draws near, as the day draws near. This is, the, this is the gospel's encouragement, is to soften, to soften each other's hearts as we grow harder, as the heart grows harder, as, as the deceptiveness of sin and the deceptiveness of evil hardens the heart, and the heart becomes like a, like a lonely hunter in its lust. He says, go to one another. Don't forsake. Don't forsake. Paul Tripp says, our words are principal tools God uses in the work he does through us. Gospel-oriented, grace-centered encouragement is speaking words and life into them. Our words are an offering. Our words, our encouragements are an offering to one another. Not only was he, did he minister deeply into their hearts, He was a humble man. Encouragers are humble people. Verse 25 in chapter 11. What was happening in Antioch was a missionary dream. Revival was breaking out in Antioch. This is what mission books write about. He left. It says, verse 25, he left for Tarsus, a hundred miles walk up north to look for Saul. Now, he could have parked it there and called himself the bishop of Antioch. He knew the customs. He understood the cultures. He had the theology down. He could have done it all. He could have said to himself, I'm enough. This is good work. Why ruin it? What the church really needed, wasn't he wasn't enough for, and he recognized that. The church needed to mature and to grow. They needed a man who knew the Old Testament very well, and he knew exactly who that man was. And he brings Paul, and he brings Saul back into the ministry. He did not need ministry and the success to affirm him and to make him. In in humility, a leadership encourager is about the good of others and the church. When a man, when a man is full of the Holy Spirit, as verse 24 says, he doesn't need ministry or people to fill him. He's full. And he ministers not out of the need of his heart, but out of the fullness of his heart. He's full. He's full. So full, he's overflowing. Verse 26, when he had found Saul, he brought him to Antioch. And then the entire year they met together and they ministered and taught. A considerable number of disciples were called for the first time Christians. Chapter 12 through 15 develops while Jerusalem had its giants, Peter and John, 
Antioch had Barnabas and Saul. It was, there was a spiritual bond. These two were a powerhouse. They ministered together in Antioch. They went on chapter 13. They were singled out by the Holy Spirit. They were sent to Jerusalem to defend and de debate the legalist heresy, spreading joy all along through Syria and Lebanon as they went, encouraging the church. Somewhere along the line in chapter 13, it's all of a sudden Saul and Barnabas. It's no longer Barnabas and Saul. Saul comes to the forefront and he takes over ministry. He advocated for him. He brought him into the ministry. Finally, I want to talk about this last point about him. And I still have so many. I do this to myself every time. Um, turn with me to Acts 15, verse 36. Let me say, encouragers are people of second chance. People of second chance. He's on the scene again. This would be the last time. Verse 36, it says, After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas agreed wholeheartedly. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with him. But Paul, the Greek here, kept insisting, insisting, insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone to work with them. Verse 39, a sharp disagreement broke out. Let me say and let me balance things out. Encouragers are not necessarily always smiley softies. Encouragers are gracious, kind, gentle, can enter the lives of hurting people down and out They're in a very non-threatening way. But at the same time, encouragers like Barnabas are the defenders of the faith. They're the apologists of the day. They're the debaters. They're leaders. Who could, who could stand in his right mind up to Saul of Tarsus? Barnabas did. What's amazing is now he's advocating for a young man who happens to be his cousin against Paul, who at one point he advocated for Paul. A failed, discouraged Mark, John Mark, needed personal time. And this man took Mark, picked up shop, and went back to their hometown to Cyprus. It's probably the worst ministerial career decision Barnabas could have made. His story could have been written throughout the book of Acts, and it stops right there in Acts 15. He invested the rest of the time in a young man called John Mark. Let me tell you about Mark. This deserter left the mission becomes such a pillar in the early church. He went on to become the apostle Peter's helper. Peter refers to him in chapter 5. He says, he says Mark, he calls him Marcus, my son. Later, Mark ended up getting a special attention from Paul to the Colossians. He says, hey, about whom you received, speaking of John Mark, cousin Mark, you received, if he comes to you, welcome him. May, take a special attention. Later, Paul to Timothy, everybody's abandoned him. Luke is only with him. He says to him, only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful, literally profitful to me in service. The deserter became faithful. To Philemon, he says, he calls Mark my fellow worker. What an honor. Mark this deserter who needed a Barnabas in his life went on to write the Gospel of Mark, which hundreds and thousands and in the millions are reading 
from the year 100 till today. Much is owed to Barnabas. Much is owed. William Barclay says, one of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It is easy to laugh at men's ideals. It is easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It is easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many a time, a word of praise and of thanks. Luke 6.45 says, A good person out of the good treasures of his heart produces good, good. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Brothers and sisters, pour into the lives of others. Younger men and women, Mark had three men. For a short time, he had Paul. For a while, he had Peter. And then he had Barnabas. Make it easy for them to enter your heart and to your life. Question for us. Hebrews 13, 7, where we started. It says, imitate their faith. And I want to close with this. Imitate their faith. And the question we got to ask this morning is, what made Barnabas? What made Barnabas? What's, what's under the hood, if you will, to the guys? What's under the hood? What is he full of? What, what possesses this man? Was he born this way? I left out Back in chapter 11, a very, very important verse that Luke and and the church describes to Barnabas in Acts 11, verses 24, Luke says, For he did these things, he did these things, he did these things for or because he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith. He was a man of triple grace. A man of triple grace. Good being the fruit of the Spirit. Hey, remember the words, no one is good but God. No one is good but God, but there was God in this man that made him good. He's not perfect. He's not perfect, but he's good. It was the goodness of Christ. It is the Fruit of the Spirit. Second, (laughs) Luke says he's full of the Holy Spirit. The language here is very different, if you will. He doesn't say Barnabas is filled with the Holy Spirit like other people. He says Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit, indicating a special and more continuous empowerment in this man's life. He's not just filled, but he is full of the Spirit. He is under the constant influence and control of Christ's Spirit. He's full of the Spirit. It was used of Christ in Luke 4.1 when he went into the desert. It is life full of the Spirit. He's not full of himself. He's not intoxicated by his own meaning and purpose and and identity. He's intoxicated. He's overcome. He's overwhelmed by the person of Christ brought about by the Holy Spirit. He's full of faith. Third, he's full of faith. Faith Faith-oriented life. Shape, life, faith-shaped life, faith-centered life, fullness of faith, life of trust, life of test, of rest, God's goodness for him in all of circumstances. He's a man of rest. People of faith are people of rest, people of peace, because faith rules their heart. Faith, in its, it looks away and beyond itself. That's what heroes of the faith will come and go. Here's the key 
of John 13, 7 and 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. What and who possessed Barnabas is here with us today. Who taught him generosity? Christ didn't sell his properties in heaven, yet he emptied himself and came and gave his life. Not a piece of land, but he gave his life. Deep in the heart, he lavished grace. He didn't give out of his grace, out of his riches. He gave according to his riches. A billionaire can give $1,000 out of his riches. But when a billionaire gives according to his riches, he pours it out. Who made him meek, humble, yet courageous and bold? Christ, the fullness of deity dwelling in a bodily form, was born in a lonely manger who will ride a donkey and die on a cross. One man put it well, Christian disciples, Christ said, are the salt of the earth. Here is the key. They should make life tasty. They should make life tasty. They should be above all else encouragers. So why did Barnabas earn the name son of encouragement? Every aspect about his life was building, comforting, supporting, consoling, encouraging, strengthening whoever was around him. He loved the person he was with. He loved the person he was with. Let me pray for us. Father, we look into Barnabas' life and we see someone greater and better than Barnabas, than Joseph. Father God, the old man is put away, taken off, died. The new man in Christ lives. Father, I pray for our fathers and sons. I pray for our moms and daughters. I pray for our brothers and sisters. I pray for our leaders. Lord, I pray for all who are here. Father, that we would become a reflection of the heavenly paraclete, a reflection to encourage, not to tear down, but to encourage those around us. Lord, this man's life has beat me over the last couple of weeks, Lord. And Father, in a good way, may, may, Christ, may Christ come out of it. May Christ, may the sweet aroma of the great advocate come forth from this congregation, from every man and woman that is here. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.